Please join me in welcoming Luis, who will introduce our esteemed speaker today. Alana, you shouldn't be taking time from the speaker by introducing me. <laughs> anyway, it's okay. my real pleasure to introduce Mercedes Pascual. Um, I had been trying to get her to come and speak at NICO for a long time, and I'm really excited that we are finally able to, to have her here. Um, she has many, many awards and distinctions, and you could have seen them in the announcement. I will just mention that she was a Centennial Fellow in Global and Complex Systems, an award from the James McDonald Foundation. Uh, she received the Robert H. MacArthur Award from the Ecological Society of America, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But I also like to usually bring up stuff that seems completely sidetracked and is just used for me to make some points. So one thing that you might have noticed about Francis Collins, who was the director of NIH uh, a little while ago, was that he was saying that he was surprised by the impact of behavioral aspects into the uh, outcome of the pandemic. And this actually relates to another distinction of Mercedes that she was actually an investigator with the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. And for some reason that I still cannot stand them, um, she not, did not keep being such an investigator in spite of all her achievements, her, uh, wonderful research and our amazing creativity. And this talks to me about the narrow mindedness of some people and some fields. And so Nico is the opposite, is about trying to get different perspectives and people with different knowledge and sharing uh, that knowledge instead of assuming that just one group of experts is going to know everything. So I encourage you to uh, appreciate all that Mercedes is going to share with us today, uh, a perspective that sadly, because we don't have an ecology department at Northwestern, is not so easily available. So uh, join me, please, in, in thanking Mercedes for, for coming and giving a talk to us. Mercedes, thank you. OK, so I'm going to share my screen now, I guess. Um. Okay. Okay. So thank you for that uh, introduction, Luis. I am very, very sorry that by postponing this talk, I didn't manage to come in person, even if I'm across the city. But uh, I guess that uh, that uh, hopefully will will soon change. So uh, first, first of all, let me start by acknowledging my co-authors in this work, the, the the two postdocs who really worked on a lot of this theory. Uh, Shishin He and Shai Pilosov, who now have moved on to their faculty position, independent positions um, in uh, Israel and also here in uh, Indiana. So, and let me start with, uh, with a quote I like from a well known theoretical ecologist, Simon Levine, who wrote The fundamental problems in the study of any complex systems are understanding what maintains diversity and how the existence of diversity affects system dynamics. It is these three features, heterogeneity and its maintenance, frequency dependence and modularity that complicate the picture and will occupy most of my attention for the rest of this paper. So if you change here modularity to network structure, this is more or less the theme I like to touch upon today. And in fact, I would say the challenge for theory uh, in ecology in this area is truly to explain diversity where it is vast. And the kinds of systems, if we think of species in communities that come to mind are the rainforests, coral reefs. Unfortunately, I will be talking about less charismatic uh, systems, about, uh, in fact, diversity at another level of organization, the strains within a parasite population. But to put that in context, let me, uh, mentioned that uh, we can classify largely theories on diversity, the large body of theory into two camps. Those that emphasize stochastic assembly, that is birth death processes, immigration and extinction, the well-known theory of island bio uh, geography by E.O. Wilson and MacArthur, and then its continuation in what we call the neutral theory of ecology by Steve Hubble falls here. 
where we can explain many patterns of communities, of diverse communities, uh, with a model essentially of immigration and extinction that assumes that species, uh, that differences between species do not matter. On the other camp, we focus on those differences and we have specific interactions that depend on traits such as competition and then resulting niche uh, formation limits to similarity. And the problem in fact in ruling neutral theory or in testing alternative hypotheses here has been one of identifying what are informative macroscopic patterns, that is patterns at the level of the whole community that can tell us about individual level processes that are important, not processes that are happening, but processes that are key. And I will claim and try to show you an example where one sees that describing the structure of diversity through networks uh, can tell us something about dominant forces in eco-evolutionary dynamics. So we are here looking at signatures of underlying processes. And um, for those of you who may be interested in a very different kind of complex system than I, the one I will talk about today, I like to sort of frame eco-evolutionary dynamics in a very general framework. I'm talking here about system assembly under specific ecological interactions and innovation. So we have individual phenotypes, which will be a combination of traits, the ecological interactions will depend on similarity of phenotypes, on some sort of distance between phenotypes. We have some stochastic dynamics of abundances, and then we have some stochastic innovation that can be in the form of mutation, recombination, immigration. So these are very general ingredients of any of assembling, dynamically assembling a complex system. Now, I'm going to be talking about an infectious disease, malaria, and this has the advantage that we know which traits underlie the interactions. So let me phrase it differently. These systems more generically are consumer resource systems. We can think that the susceptible individuals that do not have immunity are the resource, the infections are the consumers, and we all know from this, uh, for, from the times we are living through that uh, this SIR dynamics where when the number of susceptibles here in purple go down below a threshold that corresponds to herd immunity, we are then going to have the epidemic turn around. We cannot get another wave until we replenish this class through the loss of immunity or the birth of susceptibles, et cetera. The important point here in this simple model is that immunity underlies essentially the competition of hosts for the competition of pathogens for hosts. But of course, in reality, uh, we can have a diverse uh, set of strains competing for hosts so that specific immunity to specific types is going to set up this competition and which hosts can be infected by whom. So I said that we know the traits because the traits that matter here are the traits that are seen by the immune system and those are given by the recognition of molecules, uh, specific molecules that are known as antigens or the part of the molecules that are known as epitopes that are then in the memory of the immune system. But what I, we need to basically keep in mind here is that specific immunity sets up a frequency dependent competition for hosts because there is an advantage of being rare and a disadvantage of being common. So it's a negative frequency dependent competition. There is plenty of theory on models of this kind of competition, in particular, for example, in the work of Sunetra Gupta. I have a very simple example here. This kind of frequency dependence can lead to fluctuating abundances. It can also lead to coexistence, stable coexistence of non-overlapping types. And this is illustrated here with uh, uh, imagine a pathogen that has two antigens or two, two genetic loci encoding those antigens for X1 and X2, Y1 and, and Y2, so that a pathogen is a repertoire, a combination, right? Well, the stable coexistence that occurs is between these discordant types that do no longer overlap because the overlapping types are a disadvantage and have gone to zero. So what has happened is that the population is now divided in niches that are essentially the, uh, determined by different immune histories. 
and therefore the pathogens can coexist. Of course, this looks simple. It's just uh, the simplest uh, possible case. There have been uh, extensions that consider explicit evolution, that consider more traits, that apply to flu, that look at topologies of trees. I will not go there because I like to talk to you about another kind of diversity. What happens when we assemble uh, very, uh, we assemble systems from a very large pool of variation. And some parasites play that game and they do so very successfully. So I'm going to talk about one of such su very successful parasites, which in high transmission regions, it's extremely resilient. And this is Plasmodium falciparum, uh, the main causative agent of uh, malaria, where basically we are going to have uh, we to address these questions, is this kind of negative frequency dependent competition able to generate strain structure and coexistence? Do networks provide empirica, empirical signatures that this process is important? I would like to talk about the novel innovation threshold that arises from this same force that allows coexistence so that we play the competition game in a large, in a large space, but not, not uh, by chance. And finally, as does this structure matter? So I have to give you a few more details now relevant to malaria before showing you some of the modeling results. So here, what we have, um, we all know that malaria is transmitted by mosquitoes. So it goes from mosquitoes to humans and, and, and so on. Uh, the main antigen in the blood state of infection in humans is a molecule that, that, go, that is then expressed and exported to the surface of red blood cells. It has different functions, but for our purposes, what matters is that it's very variable so that each parasite produces 50 to 60 variants of this same molecule. And it has a multi-copy family gene that encodes, so 50 to 60, VAR genes, we call them the VAR family, that produces these variants. Now, what is interesting is if you ask in a local uh, population of 100,000, how many VAR genes are present in the, in the local transmission system? It is vast. My colleague Karen Day, a molecular epidemiologist and the expert in this subject, has documented of the order of 10,000 to 4,000 different genes uh, if you use a criteria of a sequence divergence. So if you think about the possible combina combinatorics here, if you were assembling this at random, it is enormous. So that, uh, sorry, so that you understand why this matters, let me just mention briefly that uh, how does this affect parasite fitness? The parasite, when it's inside the red blood cell, as uh, shown here, it basically exports this molecule to the surface of the red blood cell, but it shows the host different variants sequentially. So it's not showing all its faces at once, which essentially determines the length of infection. And the length of infection is essentially key to the fitness of the parasite because that means that if you have long duration, you can transmit more. And here, the duration will in turn depend on the history of previous exposure. So depending on host memory, you may express or not certain VAR genes. And if you have seen many of them before, as I show in this little example here, you are going to have a shorter duration, shorter possibility of producing uh, infections and therefore your fitness will be lower. So this system, which this vast diversity uh, plays a recombination game on top of all this, it basically mixes the repertoires of, of genes during the sexual stage of the parasite life cycle in the vector. So this is a shuffling of, the, of this combination of traits. It also generates new traits by recombining genes. So it's doing recombination at two levels of organization. But effectively, all of this matters because in high transmission regions, this kind of parasite, not just malaria, can achieve high prevalence despite high immunity. 
And this is, for example, for our study site here, uh, again, uh, Karen Day has shown with her team that in people in these towns, you can get, uh, this is in Ghana, of the order of 40% prevalence, if not higher. So people carrying the parasite, these are not people in the clinic. So the transmission system has a large reservoir of transmission. And this is despite high immunity, because people of all ages have been exposed, have been exposed, have immunity, but it is immunity to clinical infection and not to infection. So we cannot fight this system effectively without understanding diversity. And I like to go back to my question of whether there is some strain structure in a system with so many pieces, so much recombination. And if so, how can we tell? What are signatures that this important form of competition for host is playing, uh, playing up here? Yes. Sorry, you are muted. Can I ask a clarifying question? So when you are saying that people have immunity to um, serious complications that would lead to hospitalization, um, that, is that all the people in there or, or amongst this diversity, could you get infected by something that you'd still turn out to give you a serious case? Yes, so, that is a good question. And I'm going to say uh, for now, and it's a very important question because it, in reality, yeah, the answer is yes, there could be particular, uh, particular variants of the parasite and particular virgins that could be, that could have higher severity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to, I'm going to actually consider that other than frequency, difference in frequencies, the system is neutral so that there are no such fitness differences, but that okay. is a simplification. In reality, that's not the case. But those are the two kinds of axes that play out in any ecological system. Do you have purely frequency dependence, differences in the traits, or are there also fixed fitness advantages of different variants? Also, another point, if someone that has no immunity comes into that system, they probably would get a more severe effect yes, from yes. being infected with yeah, those, the right? children. So Yes, the children, and this is why okay. the clinical, the, the severity of malaria uh, really, you know, in children in these very high transmission regions, because the age, the age of also of uh, typical exposure will depend on the intensity of transmission. So where you have this very high immunity and high transmission, yeah, the clinical infections are particularly in the children, because they have to build up enough of a protection and yeah. and they have you know the question is do they have to have seen just enough infections or do they have to have seen enough of this diversity and i would say both right mm -hmm. but but most malaria molds just will consider that you have to have seen just enough infections without sort of considering the context of the diversity Okay, so let me, thank you. So that's, sorry, that was my introduction. I will try to be brief and then let's get to the question of structure. So the most simple question is first, is this structure uh, non-random? And uh, one way to look at this, uh, I like very much this figure, so it's not very well uh, labeled. Let me explain what it is. So essentially, uh, again, here, my colleague Karen Day and her group, they sequence isolates, they isolated the infections from the virgins from uh, every children in, um, uh, in a village in Gabon. And what you have here is a matrix of the isolates in each child against, against the same, and a quantity that measures the overlap between these isolates. So we call this pairwise type sharing, and you can see the definition is just how many types you, how many genes you have in common uh, over the total. But what matters here is the color, like the, the, low, the low overlap is in the low blue to white, and you can see that this, essentially this, this is all the children, and they show very low overlap between their, their infections. Now, what is interesting, you can reflect about this and say, well, it's not surprising. There is so much variation that if I just do this at random, this should emerge. So we randomize 
this, uh, this matrix, maintaining the frequencies. And you see here in, the, in this small graph, uh, the, the red is the observed observe mean overlap, well, the observed overlap. And the distribution here is the distribution of mean overlap between pairs in the system. So we have something that makes the system have less overlap that even we expect is this very high diversity. Now, non-random, of course, the biology is not random because there is demography in this system. By that, I mean there is growth, there is transmission. And so we have to consider uh, a comparison of the dynamics to some neutral version that remove the process of interest. So we are going to do this with a model that has specific memory and two models that we can call neutral. On the right, the complete neutrality will be a model in which the duration of infection, which is what is affecting fitness, is constant and does not depend on what you have seen. So infections come and go, they have a constant duration. Then we have this form of neutrality that is a bit more realistic in which you say, well, maybe who you have been infected by doesn't matter, but the number of infections does matter. And we are going to match the duration of infection with the number of previous infections to the, to the main model. The main model is uh, an agent-based formulation, an individual-based formulation, a stochastic one, in which we have a pool of our genes from which we can immigrate repertoires. The repertoires are our pathogens. We can transmit them between hosts and we have all the processes I talked before. So there is transmission between uh, hosts. During that phase, the parasites can exchange uh, their repertoire of our genes. And to incorporate uh, true innovation, we also allow each gene to be formed by two, essentially two, uh, two subcomponents for two epitopes that they can also recombine to, to really create new genes. So we have duration of infection and we are tracking the memory of each host. So hosts are, they are born, they die and we track their memory. Now we are going to look at the structure of the parasites in the population by uh, constructing networks of similarity between repertoires. This is similar to what I showed you, the PTS quantity, but we are using this uh, D quantity for the links so the nodes are essentially repertoires, so they are parasites. And then the, the links in, in each direction are a measure of this similarity uh, where all that changes is the uh, denominator because there can be an asymmetry depending on, for example, re re repeated uh, genes and, and which one infected you before. But all that matter is we have a network that describes similarity. Now you can say, why aren't all the nodes linked? Uh, they should be, but we use the threshold because we wanted to focus on the most similar parasites because they would be the ones that would most actively be competing for hosts, depending on their. So if, we, if something is happening uh, regarding competition, we should see it that way. So we took the tail of the distribution in these links um, and we constructed these networks. The question is, can these networks distinguish between the full model and the neutral model? And he, the, the neutral uh, versions, which are in blue and in yellow. This is, this is just one, uh, one uh, caric well, caricature or, or, or sample of a network. But the question is, uh, well, if we use smaller diversity, the red, the full model can create clusters and is very, very different from the others. You can see it by eye. But once you get to this very high, uh, high, high number of genes, that's not the case. And that's exemplified here just by the degree distribution, but you can look at other properties. You can see there are some differences, but you can, it's not so easy to pick them up. So we use a classification. We use a method to classify network structure to these, um, to the different kinds of, uh, to the different models. I'll tell you in a moment what we use. And I'm showing you here that we use different uh, properties of the networks. I think we use of the order of 30 properties going all the way from degree properties related to distances, two-way, three-way motifs, 
reciprocity and quantities related to transitivity. And what we then, what I have here in purple on the left in panel C is showing the proportion of correct classifications. So of course I know how I simulated the network so I can check which ones I'm classifying to the right dynamics. And uh, this is the probability of correct classification in purple very high for different parameters, different transmission intensity and different duration of naive infection, just to, to show that it works. And what I have on the right is one of the main axes of this classification, which network fe features uh, uh, contributed. Just to make the point that uh, it's not just one quantity, it's different, uh, different properties of the network that are co contributing. Now, if uh, just to mention then again, how we classify these, we use this method, which comes from uh, the analysis of data in uh, genetic systems with a large number of, uh, of uh, sites and so on, but we use it here <clears throat> to classify our simulations. This is called discriminant analysis of principal component. It, it basically combines in a very nice way discriminant analysis and PCA. And <clears throat> for our purposes here, it is interesting to, to, to visualize that the, the first two uh, components uh, allow us to very well distinguish the three types of simulations. Each point here is a simulation. We took a range of parameters representative of high transmission, and you see uh, the two neutral uh, sort of scenarios differentiated from the one with frequency dependent selection in red. This method gives us some uh, synthetic functions that then we can use to classify, uh, for example, data in this space. And so we use a network uh, for the, the sequences in Ghana. This is uh, again from our field side by the work of Karen Day. We use two seasons to construct a, a network and the networks are a bit small here because we have to restrict it in the empirical data to the multiplicity of infection of one when we, when we can tell that there are not multiple infections um, because we cannot separate repertoires otherwise. But those are all technical issues. The point I want to make for today is that the networks uh, here uh, can be separated and the, this, uh, the data classify with the, the model in which frequency dependent selection matters. So where competition for hosts is happening. Now we also looked at the networks in time. We wanted to look at modularity because after all, if we don't have something we can call strains, how can we think about the structure in this system? So we use here um, an analysis where, again, the, the networks uh, are linked by um, similarity, by this, uh, this same measure I showed you before, but we can also uh, link networks at different seasons, at different uh, yes, times, according to the same links, these interlayer links. And we use an analysis that uh, uh, with the that is um, that is for mo essentially modular modules within uh, within um, multi-layer networks that will identify essentially modules that are more similar within than between as usual, but will do so through time. And this is done with a method in InfoMap, which is a method based on a random walk. To the network. For our purposes, we will plot it like on the right. This is a, just a diagram where we see modules and then we see when they appear and when they are, go extinct. What is interesting is that we identify no, uh, modules here, you can see in A and B, both for the full model and for the neutral model. But what is really different is the persistence of the modules. So the, the modules persist much longer under this uh, negative frequency dependent selection. And this is nice and perhaps not surprising because after all, NFDS is a form of balancing selection. It should promote diversity, promote persistence, and it's doing so at multiple levels of organization, including the modules. So these modules are, are dynamic. <clears throat> The repertoires are distinct from each other, but they are more similar to each other, even in this very sparse 
uh, context. So I told you so far that the network structure provides a signature of the importance of specific ecological interactions. So we can see this effect of limiting similarity, even in this very high dimensional space, and that multi-layer networks uh, also exhibit these signatures on the basis of module persistence. And perhaps we can think of these modules as a concept of strain in this very diffuse system. Now, all of that is very nice. As I said, we don't have the nice clusters that we should see in a nice, as I said, under lower diversity in the malt that have considered lower diversity, we have something a bit more dynamic, a bit more complex, but still with a signature of, of uh, essentially here, selection against recombinants, maintaining a certain distance and keeping things different from each other. Okay, just two more pieces that are a bit more recent and, and that I think are very interesting at least to me, I was talking about competing in this very large space of variation. But at high transmission is not, as I say, by chance that competition is in that space. The selection we talked about is at the level of combinations of traits. But what gives us this very large pool of genes to begin with? So, I'm going to argue that it's not by chance and it's important because every time we will have this kind of selection uh, underlying diversity, if we have high diversity at one level, we will have high diversity at the lower level that enables it. So this idea comes from this threshold for the accumulation of innovation. And so here is the basic idea. It is simple, but it's, uh, it's nice. This is due to Shishin's, uh, this is Shishin's idea. If we have, we are below a diversification threshold, a new gene may arise from mutation, recombination, but its lifetime may be shorter relative to the appearance of a new gene, in which case strains come and go, but they do not accumulate. Sorry, genes come and go, but they do not accumulate. Above a threshold, we are going to see that the, they overlap and therefore we can see diver, diver, at least a diverse uh, trait variation. So we can quantify that threshold with a number which we call RDIV by reference to R0. It basically has two components, the rate at which you generate diversity and then that rate has to be multiplied by the expected lifetime of a gene uh, T new. We can, the, the rate of generation of new genes in particular includes this quantity we call P invasion, which is interesting, which is the probability that something new invades the system and becomes part of the genes that are really, uh, the, that, are, that are dividing in a sense the, 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 the pool of, of uh, diversity. In, the, in this paper, uh, Shishin gives a, an expression for this probability of invasion, and it's very explicitly connected to the number of susceptibles that, uh, that the gene has access to. I will not get into those details. I want to show you that in the simulation, that threshold indeed exists. This is from the model, from the big agent-based uh, simulator. The points are very different simulations, different parameters, different assumptions, but we can plot for a given window of time the percentage of new genes accumulated as a function of this quantity RD that we measure in the simulations. And this is the log of RD. And you see that below one, there is no accumulation. Above one, there is accumulation. And more interestingly, to me at least, this number correlates with transmission intensity measured with this malaria quantity EIR that I would be glad to explain. But basically a measure of transmission intensity. Why? Because transmission intensity is really the selection force, right? The competition depends on having a lot of transmission and, and a lot of memory. And so as this becomes stronger, then we are basically uh, moving to the right and accumulating a large pool of variation. And this is that in action where you see from the beginning of a simulation, the colors are different genes and their frequency we stacked it up. On the left, you are below threshold. 
uh, the colors come and go, the gray are things at low frequency that we have aggregated. On the right, you see the very systematic accumulation of large variation, but of course, over a long time. So presumably over long times and, and large regions, this same force that allows coexistence at the level of strains has built a very high pool of variation, right? From which the parasites are built. So if I go to low or medium transmission regions, I'm playing competition, but not with this, num with this very large space of variation. And this is by default. So let me get in a bit towards the end. The problem is if we weaken these interactions, so if for some reason we weaken the interactions, we are going to lose diversity at multiple levels. Of course, this is desirable in this case. It's not desirable in an ecological system where what matters is to preserve diversity. Let me finish by asking, well, but does all this structure matter to something? I must confess this is still work in progress. This is one paper, but uh, we, I think we are scratching the surface of understanding the connection between this structure and the consequences for dynamics, which here is epidemiology and transmission. So just to finish, we basically uh, simulated intervention. So we have seasonal transmission at three levels here on top. And during this, this pink uh, time, we are uh, basically using an intervention called IRS, which is basically insecticide with the houses with lower transmission. I will not get into details here. I want to make the point we compare the response of the system under the, the full assumptions of immune, specific immunity to one with this generalized immunity in which we match the duration of infection to the number of past infections, but we have no specific memory. And the main conclusion is that there is a lower probability of extinction of the parasite during this, this intervention periods under an FDS. And this can be seen, there are many plots, let's focus on the one on the middle at the top, this duration of five years of intervention and a given gene pool, because we did compare different gene pool sizes, for example, 10,000, you can go vertically and you see that the probability of extinction is larger for the blue generalized immunity than it is for the under selection. This is not because of higher prevalence because at the bottom, you can see that the prevalences are, compar are comparable. So it has to be because of something about diversity. And we argue in this paper, which is, I said, limited now because we understand that these simulations were a closed system and we have to consider immigration and other things. This is a busy slide. I can just read the title. Why is it that we have, we believe that we have this higher uh, persistence because the most dissimilar parasites have a higher probability of making it through perturbation. And if we plot the distribution of PTS, which is that similarity before intervention in, in, in yellow, during and after, essentially you see be, below that we can maintain the dissimilar parasites here at the lower end while we cannot do that if we have no specific memory. So, so this matters. And let me now summarize. I told you that hyperdiverse systems may well occur at the opposite end of neutrality with coexistence assembled under specific and frequency dependent interactions. That the structure of diversity characterizing similarity in trade space can be described with networks and this structure would matter to the response of the system to perturbation, although we have to better understand this. I think importantly, NFDS would set the stage for the existence of an unappreciated threshold concerning the accumulation of the variation on which biodiversity is built. So this is at different levels of organization and that we would not know we have crossed this threshold and transitioned to increase fragility unless we understand a bit more about this threshold. For those of you who like to read more about host pathogen systems and immunity, but in a very different context, this is a paper we did relating network structure and assembly, but in a very different system. This is 
microbes that also have immune memory through CRISPR to viruses. And very different kinds of dynamics here because we have periods of explosive diversification with periods of control by the microbes, something not seen before in other host parasite systems. So we are trying to understand this. And to end, because I started with forests, let me end to sport and really speculate. There are other uh, systems in ecology where we, we worry, we worry, we are interested in these kinds of forces. Some of you may have heard about the Janssen Connell hypothesis about the increased mortality of trees, uh, seedlings and saplings close to the parents in a specific manner. This seems to be uh, an important mechanism of uh, forest maintaining forest diversity. It is in the same category than what I've been talking about, but at another level of organization. So let me thank uh, again, Karen Day and her group, uh, phenomenal collaborators. And then uh, for the CRISPR system, I just like to acknowledge Rachel Whitaker at UIUC and some of the funding. Thank you. Really fascinating stuff. And I will take advantage and ask actually a, a, a bunch of, of questions. Um, so the, the first one is, I, this is, was really fascinating in the sense that it kind of for the first time, I, I think I have an inkling of why malaria has been so resistant, right? I mean, this seems to be an extraordinarily uh, um, adaptable and robust way to, to persist. Uh, because you have so many people that have no symptoms and you create a pool, but then whenever you have a naive individual coming in, they are going to be affected very, very seriously. Um, what is the, the chance that other potentially severe human pathogens will evolve in that way? Right, because I mean, right now, most of the world is kind of unaware or uncaring about what's going on with malaria because of what it is located. But we could, I mean, there is, we could have something similar occurring with other pathogens uh, and affecting more of the, the world if the mode of transmission is not uh, mosquito bites, but is a respiratory disease or something like that. What, from your perspective? Yeah, this, well, no, it's very interesting. I must say that, um, first of all, this, and again, this is malaria high transmission, right? Because we, uh, if you go to low transmission, you are going to have much, much less diverse, strain diversity, genetic uh, diversity and so on. But we, we would like to, to really emphasize that uh, the difference. And I think like, as you say, this is a system that has in a lot of uh, machinery for adaptation that is an incredible game. And, and I say it's not just played by malaria. In fact, uh, trypanosomas uh, are also uh, parasites that have even these multi-copy family genes, but even bigger, they can have a thousand copies of a given. And of course, as I, as I said, we, well, let's an answer first your question. We don't, uh, so there are, there are other pathogens, including pathogens um, of wildlife that are important in the context of uh, agriculture and so on that have strategies like this. And again, I think it's a strategy because instead of, uh, for example, the viruses we are concerned about like flu and so on are mutating, but are essentially replacing each other, right? Rather than coexisting at high diversity. So completely different strategies, also very successful, but completely different strategies. This, um, so, so the, the, the question of resilience here in this context is very interesting because it's not, it's not necessarily just this uh, space, uh, sort of space time dynamics of strains replacing each other like we are seeing with COVID or flu, it is really this very, very uh, high persistence locally under high transmission. Um, so, so in that sense, it's a different strategy. It's a family of parasites. It's not just malaria and, um, and there are some bacteria. Um, 
I'm not aware of any any virus that 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 goes this way. And and again, partly is that um, you know how 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 you achieve this uh, this kind of complexity and um, to begin with is is interesting. Some of the genetically, some of the virgins in uh, parasites of humans can be traced back to malaria parasites of primates, which gets back to this question of persistence at different scales, right? Like on the very long-term persistence of the, the genetic components and then the, the persistence of parasites so assembling the genes, right? At another level of organization. So it is a strategy I'm most familiar, and again, it's not unique to malaria and it's very um, resilient. So the parasites that exhibit these have all high prevalence despite uh, high immunity. Uh, and so we are not going to, to be able to do, to do something about these systems unless we better understand uh, this question of diversity. Um, there is another question in the chat, but uh, since I'm on the panel, I will take advantage of my immense power to ask a follow-up question instead, which it is, does this, when the these, these parasites strategies, this diversity, does that preclude the development of vaccines as, as, uh, as a good strategy? Uh, yeah, that and... is a, that's a very interesting question. In fact, the vaccines, for malaria, have to target uh, have to target uh, less variable uh, parts of the essentially of the of the of the parasite, and and this this is part of why why the vaccines against malaria cannot be uh, successfully as successful or successful in the long term. Uh, there is. There are some efforts connected to looking at these multi-copy family genes uh, for questions of vaccines, but it makes it uh, very, very difficult. Um, yeah. One tiny follow-up question. You, you have this idea that you can have um, each pathogen individual uh, expressing 50 to 60, right? And you have a large number of possibilities that are exempt that existence in the pool of, of individuals. Um, how low can you push those numbers to find yourself in this situation that would still be called high diversity? So yeah. would be five in each pathogen enough? So, uh, it, there must that be a transition. Is, yeah, no, that is a very interesting question. And, um, and I have to say generally, uh, yeah, we are not considering the question of what would be an optimal, given certain conditions, what would be an optimal length of the, of the repertoire? As I said, some parasites have multi-copy family genes with a thousand versus 50. And, and then there is the question of, here we have a bit of a caricature, like we are expressing them all sequentially. Uh, remember that each parasite is doing that sequential game, but then, during one infection in one host, they have to all more or less synchronize. And what is interesting is all the parasites within an infection are to some degree synchronized, to some degree, because otherwise showing your cards at different times will not work. Yeah. But anyhow, just to say that there are all these interesting questions, people have been uh, trying to look at questions on the, uh, you know, other aspects, as you were saying, evolution of the length of the repertoire, I mean, the optimal length of the repertoire and so on. Um, we have a question, I mean, I mentioned for 10,000, let's say, when they look at sequences or markers, markers of the gene, but, you know, we don't have a genotype phenotype map. So we have to make the assumption that a lot of that variation is meaningful to the immune system. Even if it's not 10,000, even if it were a thousand, it's a lot, right? And, uh, and so to some degree, we don't have a handle on, the, on that map. And so it's hard to ask some of these, these questions, but I think what would survive is the, the, the kinds of outcomes. As I said, we can see with very, uh, in moles of uh, five loci with five variants each or three variants each or, or two, we can see these repertoires, but then they form this, this you know, very clear uh, 
discordant groups, let's say, right? So, so here, I think we were interested in how does limi limiting similarity look in a much, uh, much higher space. So, so Saul Juarez has a question. Uh, hello, Mercedes. Could you explain a bit more about how you studied modularity over time in the multi-layer uh, representation? Yes, this was essentially with the. Um, essentially, if you look at the at the method that is under the the known as InfoMap or under the the software InfoMap, they have a phenomenal website if you want to look at the, the methods, but essentially you are not um, using uh, the typical modularity, um, you, you are not looking at one quantity that are, you are trying to, to maximize or minimize, you are looking at the, the a quantity that will re relates to the movement of random walkers along those connections. Of course, you are not really using random walkers in the network, but there is a quantity related to, to that random movement. So I would, I would say, uh, that's not a very good explanation, but I would direct you to, to look at the, the website of InfoMap that has very nice uh, examples and, uh, and, and uh, of how that works, right? And essentially, of course, the the idea here is uh, that you the the time it takes, right, to move through. It, you are going to be using the time it takes to move through uh, to certain pathways, right, as a function of the of the structure or the or the connectivity. So so yeah, that's that's how how we are looking at this. And again. Again, the concept of the modules is as before, right? It's the standard concept of the modules that uh, that you have, you know, more connections within than between, uh, than between, but it's just the way you identify them. And I think for multi-layer networks, this is this method is is particularly nice, right? If uh, I think Luis is more of an expert, but I I think it's a it's a very nice approach. Yeah, I, I like InfoMap a lot too. And, and as you said, they have good software and they also have written very clear papers about how the method works and all of that. So I, I have another question. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, if at some point you are tired of my questions, you can tell me to stop. Um, it's, it's about the connection between this system and an area in which I don't know if people have used it or not, which is regard the, regarding misinformation. Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if you are, if you think about some people that want to spread misinformation as one of these pathogens, right? And the idea is that they are presenting certain stories, right? Your variants to then be the bunker, right? You could imagine that there could be a strategy in which you maybe present a story all the time, or you actually present sort of variations of a story over time in a coordinated way. So there is kind of a moving target, right? You're saying, oh, I could debunk this story, but now I've modified it in such a way that it's not the same. So I have to go and debunk that one uh, uh, and stuff like that. And um, it, it's, it's very, to me, very interesting how, how this approach of thinking about things in, uh, in, in terms of ecology, right? And, and competition of things and, and, and um, occupying niches can be also very relevant in a number of other contexts. You could also imagine it in terms not only of misinformation, but also in terms of products that companies yeah. Yes, develop, this is, uh, right? I, 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 was, uh, I was discussing, in fact, with someone from Nico, uh, some analogies for, for, for innovation in technical systems. Um, right. and, and, and what some of these uh, insights may, may bring into that. So, so yes, I think I would love to, to find some, some systems in which one can make some of these analogies, in particular, for example, about this question of this threshold for the existence of systems where under certain conditions you, you would have uh, lots of, let's say, lots of misinformation running around versus places where, where you have less, right? Is, 
is this something uh, that, of course, you have to sort of view it in terms of competition, some form of antagonistic interaction, something that creates negative frequency dependence, but there is no reason why it would not apply. But mm -hmm. you have to you have to sort of think that the whatever interactions or fitness you have in mind, right, has to have to do with some sort of combination of, in this case, stories or combination and uh, and memory in the system, right? Uh, yeah, I just thought well, about another example: uh, cryptography, right? Encoding messages and codes that cannot be broken. Right, it, 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 in, in which you have this competition about you want to use a code that is not detected, which would be similar to presenting a particular yeah. variant to the immune system. And when the immune system finds a way to, to handle it, it's like you broke the code. So that is no longer secure. So you have to change. And now, but you also have to coordinate with the other ones, right? Uh, yes. So, yes. so uh, I, I, would, I would think there are many... Um, yeah, there are many systems in which we may think in particular, for example, you were thinking technical innovation, which may have to do with um, essentially building something from a combination, right? You need to have a combine mm -hmm. some variation and then, and then you can evolve the pieces. Mm -hmm. or, but of course, the, the, the selection is happening at the level of this these groups of, of traits. So, and it doesn't need to be here. It's, uh, I think that I presented something also showing that the same process that allows diversity is acting at two levels of organization. I think like thinking about that would be quite interesting um, yeah. to, to ask this, this question. I, um, again, I think if we go around biogeographically, we are not going to find places with low transmission and very high diversity. Uh, so there is this, this uh, correlation that is not by chance. And I think it would be really nice to, to see. Uh, so what is important here, you have to maintain this intensity of contact, yeah. Yeah. right? To, to keep the system in this state. And, uh, and I was imagining when I said a hidden threshold is that, you know, you can say who cares if the diversity is neutral or not. But what is interesting to me, if you think about the rainforest as something that, that involves many interactions we will never completely decipher, but that could be highly specific and be playing in this, in this manner, but obviously in a much more complex manner. Uh, versus one in which things are coming and going. So we see certain patterns, but it's just in this neutral fashion. The kind of threshold at which you would lose the, the, the diversity at one level and not be able to build the upper one is not the same as a demographic extinction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that it's interesting. Are we doing things to to those ecosystems that are going to bring, bring the interactions under less, essentially less interaction, mm -hmm. having this negative feedback. And, yeah. and yeah. anyhow, that's, that's something that I, I think is, is interesting because the collapse of these systems would be very different than the collapse of uh, uh, just demographic collapse, right? Yeah, I think that that was, one of the things that was so fascinating for me is the, the range of contexts in which you could imagine using this framework. And now it opens your mind to possible outcomes. Not only that, but also the possible ranges where certain strategies may work or not, right? That yeah. The fact that in high transmissibility versus low transmissibility, you have something different. If you are thinking about an innovation context, you know, there this could also be something about there are places in you want in which you want to innovate a lot and others in which you have to be much more cautious on what you are doing or you don't need it, or if you are doing too much, puts you at a competitive disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So um yeah. it's now after one, and I think lots of people have to leave uh, or have already left, but um Mercedes, I want to thank you so much for. Uh, yes, well, I will take your yeah, I will take your invitation and, and come one of these days. But uh, I mean, since we are not that far, let's hope yeah. that uh, 
that that becomes possible soon. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for an interesting discussion. Uh, goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Everybody.